Hello everyone, welcome back to Hewlett Packard's Lab podcast from Research to Reality. I have a great honor and pleasure for the second time to have Ray Bozolet back on this podcast. Ray came directly uh, from Seattle for this and other opportunities. Just for this podcast. Thank you, Ray. Today we'll be talking about quantum computing. We will start uh, with the introduction uh, of, of quantum. And uh, Ray, can you tell us what is quantum computing in the first place? Uh, quantum computing is a field of study mm -hmm. that is uh, trying to build uh, computational technologies that follow every step of the way the rules of quantum mechanics very cleanly without any uh, interaction with our part of the universe, the one that we experience on a regular basis. Uh, and uh, to enforce those quantum rules to allow a very large solution space to be explored in parallel. Uh, and so the, the main difference is that while those quantum systems are working, they are untouchable. You cannot interact with them at all. You have to leave them be. So think of opening a little door to uh, the quantum part of the universe, putting your computational technology, your computer, behind that door, closing the door, and then waiting until you think that it's done, and then you can open the door and see how the computation turned out. No debugging, nothing else like that. You just have to leave it be. Very interesting. So no mocking around. With... <laughs> no, no. So, so technologies are quite interesting. You know, they become extremely popular, then they go away, then they come back. Same thing happened to AI. Why is quantum computing suddenly popular again? You worked on it many years ago, didn't you? Yes, uh, I think that there is a belief, particularly in the enterprise community and the venture capital community, that the uh, quality of the engineering of quantum technologies has improved to the point where uh, the likelihood that there will be a payoff uh, in, in investments in quantum technology is, if not right around the corner, then in the relatively near future. And so that's inspired uh, quite a lot of interest. But there's even more to it. There's a term that has been heavily used as of lately, so-called quantum supremacy. What does it mean? It means that, uh, it means that there is a particular computation that is designed literally to be easy for a quantum computer to do and hard for a classical computer to do. And so these are artificially designed problems uh, that have solutions that are not very interesting. They just aren't. Uh, nevertheless, they are remarkably difficult things for classical computers mm -hmm. to do that it should be possible for quantum computers to execute. And so think of it rather than something useful or practical. Think of it as a technological milestone that means that the engineering that has been done by uh, people in the community has reached a particular level of proficiency uh, that now it really can address uh, these very difficult problems. You've been comparing in this few minutes that we've been talking quantum computing to other sciences, engineering. How does it relate? Well, quantum computing is, I would say, uh, a, a natural evolution of, uh, in, of applications of quantum mechanics to information technology. And I know that sounds pretty vague, but think of it this way. Um, ever since uh, Schrodinger's equation was used to solve transport problems in uh, transistor-based circuits, uh, we have been doing computing that rely, relies on quantum calculations, on quantum mechanics. The main difference between the way quantum mechanics was applied to information technology in the past and the way it's applied now is that in the past what, what we have been trying to do is to suppress uh, quantum mechanics and to abstract it away so that we don't have to think about quantum mechanics when we are designing um, uh, information technology like computers, right? And so that's why you can put 10 billion transistors on a single chip. With quantum computing, that is absolutely no longer the case. You absolutely must pay 
close attention to quantum mechanics and without a deep understanding of quantum mechanics right now. This is something we can talk about later. This is, I think, one of the biggest problems the field has. But without a deep understanding of quantum mechanics right now, you really can't even design a quantum computer or uh, you cannot uh, operate it. So it's a, a profound difference. Very interesting. Let's go back to applications. I think everything is driven by applications. What are the promising applications for quantum computing? There, in principle, are application areas that include machine learning, that include search, that include cryptanalysis, and that include what I would call science, and, um, uh, and then discovery. So, for example, drug discovery, etc. cetera. Uh, I do not think that there's any particular reason to believe that machine learning will ever see, or optimization for that matter, will see quantum computing really take over and start uh, offering things that we aren't able to do on classical systems. But I think uh, the two that remain, that it's clear that in principle there's a uh, uh, substantial reason to be hopeful, is uh, cryptography for now, but even more uh, quantum chemistry. And so the ability to understand incredibly complex uh, quantum calculations, solve quantum transport problems, something that cannot be done even uh, conceptually on classical systems now would be solving quantum dynamics problems. Quantum, you know, it's, uh, uh, and then uh, ground states of very complex uh, molecules. Uh, in principle, uh, quantum computers should be able to dramatically outperform uh, a, a classical computer uh, that's executing a similar algorithm. But does quantum computing have any competitors? You mentioned machine learning, some other AI techniques. Yes, absolutely. I, I think that there's this misconception, uh, particularly in the popular press, that the appropriate comparison for a quantum computer is a high-performance computer doing um, multi-dimensional FFT or uh, MapReduce or uh, GUPS, you know, random access, or something like that. And I think that's a completely uh, mistaken belief. I'm seeing in a way that I did not anticipate even a few years ago, uh, encroachment of uh, machine learning into scientific fields that I never really thought uh, was ever going to be possible. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I was skeptical, um, let's see, what's the right way to explain this? Imagine now when we train a neural network to recognize images. What do we do? We start with uh, millions of images that uh, have elements in them that we would like our neural network to be able to recognize, to select. And we train it and train it and train it and train it. And it then uh, has, and then eventually it reaches a point of proficiency where it can start recognizing uh, these image elements in other places, you know, in data that it is uh, not even necessarily directly comparable uh, to the training data that was used to bring it up to speed. But how would you use a technique like that to discover a new material? What do you train it on? Uh, what do you tell it to look for? Uh, this is an extremely difficult problem, and the way that people are solving it, including us and our own research now, is by incorporating in what I think is a, a, a deep and interesting way the relevant physics into uh, the neural network. So in other words, a physics-based machine learning approach. And uh, these uh, techniques are really exciting. Uh, they work a lot better than I thought they would. And so you can use uh, machine learning now to solve protein folding problems, alpha fold. You can use machine learning to solve fluid mechanics problems. Uh, that, uh, you know, these are areas, uh, these are advances that uh, I, I did not anticipate. And I'm extremely impressed. And now uh, machine learning is also uh, making advances in quantum chemistry. Uh, and in, in areas where the gold standard for uh, a decade has been uh, DFT, density functional theory. And so uh, it's, 
uh, remarkable to see uh, machine learning techniques actually start understanding properties of molecules in a way that um, has uh, not been done using anything like the, those techniques in the past. Competition is always good. I agree with you completely. But quantum computing is competition to traditional computing. And for computer scientists like me, but beginners in quantum computing, how would you explain quantum computing? I know in computer science there are bits. Zero or one, you build from it. How do you do computation in quantum computing? It's, uh, what is really interesting about uh, quantum computing is that uh, it is possible for, through uh, what's called coherent superposition which people have a better understanding of than they, <laughs> than they recognize. I'll explain that in a minute. But in the case of uh, a quantum bit, a qubit, um, it is possible for that state to be represented as not just being a zero or a one, but as being a zero with a certain probability and a one with a certain probability. And it's even more sophisticated than that because the relationship between the likelihood that it's a zero and the likelihood that it's a one can also be described by complex numbers. And uh, it's, it means that there's an enormous amount of information stored in only one qubit. And so that's why it should in principle be possible, maybe we'll have time to talk about this later, but it should in principle be possible to store a pit a bit of data in just 50 qubits. Uh, and, and so this, uh, so that's one thing, the fact that uh, coherent superposition allows a tremendous data compression. But then the other thing uh, that is incredibly interesting about quantum computing is that when you take some set of qubits and you start operating them together as a computer, uh, they can explore a solution space that has a just absolutely gigantic dimensionality with an exponentially large number of potential solutions and it can search that space in parallel. And in principle that gives it a tremendous advantage. Now there's a catch. In fact there's two catches. Catch number one is that those 50 qubits they can store uh, in principle um, uh, a petabit of data, but when you measure their state, and this is one of the, uh, something that you could say is unfair about uh, quantum mechanics. When we measure a quantum mechanical state consisting of 50 qubits in some arbitrarily complex relationship, we only get 50 classical bits of information when we're done. Only 50. All right? The second catch is there's no such thing as a quantum hard drive. And so uh, the quantum no cloning theorem tells us that we can't make an identical copy of a quantum state. And so that means that if I go to all the trouble of uh, taking a petabit of classical data and storing it in a 50 qubit state, I then don't get to write that into a quantum hard drive and then read it out as many times as I like. As soon as I touch those qubits, that data has been transformed and it's not recoverable. So raised qubits are only raised qubits, they can't touch raised qubits. That's right, exactly. You almost answer my two following questions, but I'll ask them anyways. In traditional computing, you know, we don't stop with bits. You know, out of bits we build bytes, we build words, integers, floats, etc. So that's one question that you kind of answered, but I'd like you to answer in more detail. And related to that, very much related is the operations. So in traditional uh, computation, we have um, arithmetics and logical operations and doors, etc. You start with all of these and then you calculate. How do you build up from these qubits and what are the operations that you use? Really, the, one, of the, uh, one of the ways you can tell that quantum computing is still in a fairly primitive uh, state as a field is that programming a quantum computer now is very, very similar 
to using assembly language techniques on the ENIAC or any of the other vacuum tube related technologies from uh, the last century. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's uh, remarkable uh, to me that quantum circuits, which are the essence of a quantum uh, computation, right? A quantum circuit is a sequence of quantum gates. And there are single qubit quantum gates, there are two qubit quantum gates. More complex quantum gates are significantly harder to implement, but let's not worry about that right now. But the point is that as you, you know, you will typically draw a diagram of qubits propagating from left to right in time. And you will see uh, graphical representations of particular operations that are conducted on these qubits. And they, to entangle two qubits, if those qubits are trapped ions, you bring them together to the same physical location. If it's photons, uh, there are all sorts of things you can do to entangle them, but, but one thing that you can do is bring them together on a beam splitter. Um, there are uh, single qubit operations that um, in, are represented by um, just doing a rotation. And so again, in an ion trap or uh, uh, other atomic quantum computer, you apply laser fields and you change the physical state of them. But these are all complex physical operations that are being executed by running a recipe on a classical computer. So there's a, a certain um, uh, irony there. Mm -hmm. that in order to run a quantum computer, you have to have a classical computer that you've programmed to execute the quantum gates. But it is still happening at an extremely crude level. There isn't in quantum computing yet wide availability of anything that looks like libraries or subroutines or any modularity at all. I mean, it's begun. You know, you see uh, quantum software companies beginning to think in terms of uh, modularity and optimization, but it's still a very, very long way away. So uh, I, I think that the it's very it's very difficult to make a direct comparison uh, between quantum and classical computing because the quantum computing uh, programming it is still so crude now. Thank you. This was very helpful. And you know that we researchers are attracted to difficult. So Absolutely. It's, it's very difficult to compare. <laughs> I'm nevertheless going to ask you to compare. You spoke about innards, you know, inside uh, uh, data elements. You spoke about uh, elementary operations. But how do you program it in a big picture? Traditional computer has been using von Neumann model for I don't know how many decades. You know, where you got data in, data out, in between. You store in memory, load from memory, in central processing. Right. Do you There's do any of these? Not really, no. I, you know, the, you, you'll have a collection of qubits that you initialize in a particular quantum state. And then you will execute a sequence of one qubit and two qubit operations in order to implement a particular program. And again, this is, when you say load and store, if you mean assembly language, level load and store, then yeah, then it's kind of like that. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in terms of reading in a gigantic amount of data and then operating on that data, there's nothing like that in quantum computing. That's in fact something that's very important. Uh, again, we may get to that in a bit. But the, um, but there, there isn't at this point uh, a particularly uh, uh, straightforward way of programming the classical computer to run the quantum computer. And the quantum computer is literally, it's got its bits, and those are the qubits, and those are the only ones you're gonna get. And you're manipulating those, and when you're done, you read them out. And if you have 50 qubits, you get 50 bits. So let's hope that what you're looking for is a 50-bit number, because that's what you're gonna get. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the challenges. That the See, the way to think of it is that as the quantum computer is searching the solution space in parallel, when you write the program, what you are trying to do is make it incredibly likely that the correct answer is highly probable to be read out mm -hmm. at the conclusion of the computation. But there's no guarantee that when you make that measurement at the end, 
that you will in fact get the correct answer, even if it was 99% likely. You might have gotten the 1%. And so typically in a quantum computation, you repeat it. And there are a variety of different ways you could say, well, you know, do we take the most popular answer, the one that we get the most often? Do we look at the mean of the distribution? I mean, this is all, uh, these are terms of art now that uh, people don't completely understand. But the, the, the uh, quantum computing is following these uh, very, very complex laws of quantum mechanics as they evolve. But in the end, the answer that you get is a probabilistic one. You're really taking my job away. You're answering the <laughs> questions that I'm going to pose you. Sorry. My question would have been, have you not had already explained it, let's pretend I'm a chemical engineer in the area that you said quantum computing is extremely promising. How would I use? And I got from general manager, shiny new quantum computer, and he said, here it is, program it, do it. How, what am I going to do? How am I going to do it? Well, right now, if you don't understand how to, if you don't understand quantum circuits, it's going to be difficult for you to use it. You're going to have to hire someone with a PhD in quantum computing, right? I'll, I'll bring some of my buddies. There you go. That's the, that's the right answer. Um, most problems, though, even in chemistry, uh, when you talk to pharmaceutical companies, they'll tell you that to, to discover a new chemical, it, the problem might require 90% setup and uh, thermodynamics and fluid mechanics and a variety of other things that are best solved classically. And then five or 10% of the full story uh, is going to be a, the quantum state, you know, the ground state of a uh, particular molecule or how that particular molecule transports uh, its uh, electrons from one location to another, like photosynthesis or something like that. So the, um, really you have to know two things. The first is the quantum computer will not, is, is not going to be a general purpose computer. I am happy to tell you that there will never be a useful version of Excel on a quantum computer. All right? No PowerPoint? No. Oh, God. <laughs> Actually, that, no, I'm not going to go there. The, anyway, the, <laughs> the, um, the, important thing to understand is that there's no reason to expect a quantum computer to replace a traditional, say, exascale machine. It's better to think of it as an accelerator for the part of the problem that really is quantum, that really requires quantum mechanics to uh, solve. So just, it's just one part of a big computation. So you said that we are not quite there. At the current rate of technology and investments that countries around the world are putting into quantum computing, can we predict when quantum can be uh, come what it is expected to be? No. <laughs> uh, I'm not a venture capitalist, so I don't know how those decisions get made. Um, but I don't think at this point it is possible to predict when quantum computing will be a thing. But I'll tell you what it'll look like when it is. All right? So imagine one day you open uh, a scientific journal, science, physical review letters, or you open the newspaper, and you see uh, a dramatic new revolutionary result, something that has just changed the way we think about a particular field. The fact that that discovery was made with a quantum computer is ancillary to the discovery. But right now it's all backwards, right? Quantum, you do a computation on a quantum computer and the thing that makes that remarkable is that the quantum computer did it, not the result. Because generally the results aren't particularly accurate. Mm -hmm. They're not solving particularly interesting problems. And so the, um, You'll know when quantum computing is a thing uh, because it taught us something amazing. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't publish any papers where I say, hey, I have this laptop and it has these characteristics, and oh, by the way, I used it to model this uh, laser system, right? I, I just talk about modeling the laser because everyone assumes I'm going to use a computer. So we have not reached that stage in quantum computing. When we do, then it'll be a real field. It'll be a thing. Excellent, very interesting. You know, I, I would have never thought that way. 
But to be a little bit more specific, you told me you don't know when it will happen, but do you know how it will happen that quantum computing will reach that state? I think that there are a couple of uh, hallmark uh, achievements along the way that are going to absolutely have to happen before uh, we can rationally predict when quantum computing will arrive on the scene and uh, be uh, revolutionary, right? Because it'll give us revolutionary answers. It'll lead to revolutionary discoveries. And so right now, you know, it's, we hear a lot about, well, this quantum computer has this many qubits and that one has that many qubits. But all these qubits are um, very noisy, very low quality. Uh, it's very difficult to get them to collaborate properly uh, on computing a real answer. And part of the problem is that you actually need a fairly large number of qubits still in order to represent what's called a logical qubit. So what people are building now and what they talk about are physical qubits. What they need to do is use error correction algorithms to create a collection of physical qubits that can represent a perfect, noise-free, long-lived qubit. And those are the qubits that you need in order to execute a quantum algorithm of interest. I think part of the problem now is that no one really knows when error correction is going to be really available and reliable. There are estimates of, like by John Preskill, that at this point in time you might need uh, 1,000 noisy qubits in order to represent one logical qubit with the available error correction algorithms. And so until we have many, many, many thousands of physical qubits, we probably are not going to have very many uh, logical qubits. And so if all of a sudden uh, we see at scientific conferences or the next generation of venture capitalists are interested in seeing a hundred uh, uh, logical qubits, and machines are built that have a hundred logical qubits. I think at that point, we could expect to discover interesting things in chemistry. Um, but that might require 100,000 physical qubits. How long is that going to take? Uh, is it a better idea to just say the heck with it, we'll keep the number of qubits we have now, but we'll focus on reducing the noise? You know, instead of a 1% error rate, uh, we'll try to reduce it to a tenth of a percent in all of our quantum gates. Because those errors add up after many, yep. many gates, right? And so the, uh, in order for the field to move forward, it has to make a decision. You know, how do we add physical qubits? How do we collect them and then execute uh, uh, these uh, error correction algorithms to produce higher quality qubits that can be used to do reliable computations? And Right now, I don't have a very good sense, uh, and that might just be me being ignorant, but I don't have a very good sense of when that's gonna happen. But in other words, there are opportunities for different types of technologies that help address these limitations of quantum computing, and perhaps it will come sooner rather than later. I hope so. Yeah. So we have a common practice in, in, in this podcast to end on a personal note. Uh, we already spoke about you last time, we didn't talk about Scotch, but, but I'm really curious, how did you uh, first start thinking about quantum computing? It must have been a long, long time ago, wasn't it? Not really. I, uh, I did my PhD uh, by making a very precise measurement. Uh, it, it's so an unbelievably obscure experiment where you measure the frequency of a of a forbidden, uh, single photon forbidden transition in atomic hydrogen, going from the 1s to the 2s transition. You need two photons to do it. And so I made a very, very precise measurement uh, so that you could start sussing out, uh, for example, just beginning to see the effect of the finite diameter of the proton mm -hmm. on uh, that frequency. Um, and so I became uh, very interested in quantum effects and uh, really quantum field theory and other things uh, when I was doing those experiments. I also, uh, this is uh, ridiculous, but I just remembered it, I was one of the very few pe first people I knew to use a spreadsheet in physics because there had been so many calculations of the Lamb shift, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a tiny energy shift 
in uh, due to quantum uh, field theory effects in that 1s, 2s transition. And the way people were doing it was saying, okay, we're going to start with all the other calculations before, and then we're going to calculate this tiny correction term. And so I actually found out that two papers had published at the same time, and they had uh, both started from the same place, and then they had uh, made a correction to the same calculation, and then papers in the future, some of them started from this paper, some of them started from that paper, and I finally got the right number by just putting it as a spreadsheet. So uh, that wasn't uh, because I thought that quantum computing would eventually give us a better Excel. It was because, hey, I have this spreadsheet, maybe it's useful for something. Um, but the, uh, I became interested in quantum computing about 12 or 13 years ago because I was in Australia talking to some researchers about uh, nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond, uh, which are formed when a, uh, there's uh, a uh, nitrogen atom that knocks a carbon out of the diamond lattice, mm -hmm. and in the process also creates a vacancy in, the la in, the, in an adjacent uh, lattice position. And so the nitrogen vacancy uh, center, a color center in diamond. And I thought that it should be possible to engineer that so that you could produce a very, very large number of NV center based qubits in a piece of diamond. And I worked on that for about eight years, nine years. But in the end, I decided that, you know, I kept trying to buy just a two inch wafer mm -hmm. of one micron of uh, high quality single crystal diamond on oxide, on silicon, and it was, we were just getting no closer to it. And I said, at this point, we're just competing with universities. We aren't really uh, doing something unique uh, mm -hmm. to a company. And so uh, we walked away, even though we were very successful at the time. So that surprised a lot of people. Um, but, uh, but, you know, we, I, I, in parallel, tried to figure out what you might be able to use two or three qubits for. I was inspired by the story that one of the first commercially viable applications of the transistor was the hearing aid. Um, and, uh, and that application reduced the price enough that um, uh, transistor radios became practical because engineers could start buying transistors just to play around with it. So my goal was to figure out, well, here's what you could use two, three, four, five, six qubits for. Um, and uh, then you put it in the hands of engineers and see what they come up with. But it was very hard, uh, too hard for me anyway, uh, to come up with applications of just a handful of qubits. So I failed in that. Well, but you at least um, learn a lot. Absolutely. And, I don't regret any of it. And you were able to teach me a little bit. So thank you very much. Certainly. Uh, I hope our audience has learned at least uh, as much as I have. I'm sure much more. And then I think you promised to me in about six months, we'll have another podcast. Sure. Which won't be one on one, but will be more about the new things. Is that right? Absolutely. Okay. Thanks again, Red. Certainly. My pleasure.